everyone. Welcome to the Incubator Podcast. This is your co-host, Sabir Sram. And I'm Darren Boyd. And today we're talking to Lacework. It's a cloud security company and uh, it's, it's valued at $8.3 billion. They've raised over $1.9 billion in capital thus far. Um, and we're joined by Mark Nanakoven, who's a distinguished cloud strategist, um, but also a, a really interesting background that we're hoping he'll get into. A lot of research, um, uh, technology columnist, I don't want to take too much out of it, but his career has really been defined in, uh, in covering and, and being um, an authority in this domain. So Mark, before we begin, just want to invite any listeners to the podcast that if you want to hear more information, please reach out to myself and Sabir. All of our details are on our website, incubator.com. Mark, why don't we turn it over to you? You can give us an intro to yourself, to Lacework, and then we'll, we'll dive into the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Darren, and thanks, Sabir, for having me on the show today. Um, so as you said, my name is Mark Nonokovan. Um, I've been doing cloud and cloud security uh, for quite a long time. Um, you know, security, obviously, longer than the cloud thing, because the cloud is, is still, you know, 10, 15 years in. Um, I work for a company called Lacework. We're a cloud security company. Uh, we take really a data-driven approach uh, to the problem, which I think is the, the, the way to go as far as looking at security. Not like we traditionally have looked at security as far as, like, it's the only thing and the most important thing, but really that it's part of the bigger business. Um, and I'm sure we're going to dive into that uh, as we go along. Thanks, Mark. Um, so you said data driven. I have some little fun facts here that we'll, we'll tee up here. There was a Lacework commissioned 2022 cloud security outlook um, research report of which there were 37% of respondents that said unknown vulnerabilities were going to be the greatest uh, security risk. Uh, to the environment, case in point, Log4j as, as an example. 95% um, said, hey, we're going to be uh, increasing our digital footprint by 2025 uh, to about 95% of the respondents said they'll, they'll be increasingly more digital. 44%, hey, said, look, we are struggling with skill sets in the security, in the cloud security domain, security as a whole. So when you take all of these data points together, uh, Mark, where does Lacework really begin to attack cloud security and the true value proposition behind the platform? Yeah, um, and so, I mean, uh, if you think about all those numbers together, if they really mean that companies are building more and building faster, uh, and they're doing that in the cloud, and they don't have as a good a handle on what's actually happening. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but I think, you know, as you guys well know, having been around the profession for a long time, we build a lot of stuff. And when things really get rolling, uh, you know, companies and teams within those companies are building and innovating at a really good clip, which is good for the business, but it starts to sort of make the security teams, it makes us really nervous because we don't have our heads wrapped around what's going on. And so that's a fundamental problem that everybody is, is trying to deal with, whether they're aware of it or not. And a lot of the time you see people saying, you know, oh, I need to solve for this particular security issue. And really what they need to do is take a step back first and, and get visibility across the extent of what they're uh, dealing with IT wise and in the cloud. And so where, what we do at Lacework with our polygraph data platform is really get as much data as possible about the environment that our customers are running. Uh, and so, you know, Know, how many accounts there and assets they've got in AWS, what they're doing in Google Cloud, in Azure. And the idea is, is we pull all that data into the Polygraph data platform and analyze it and try to contextualize it for uh, those customers, so for those teams. So not only do they get an idea of what they're running, but what's important. So, you know, you mentioned Log4j as far as a good example of an unknown issue. And that one was really tricky because, you know, nobody said, oh, yeah, we deploy Log4j because it shows up in a whole bunch of different places. I know uh, my partner's a research scientist and it turns out that all their um, sequencing equipment had that vulnerability. They had no idea um, because they were just like, oh, this is our sequencers. And it just happened to run a Java stack and it happened to be using Log4j. And you think of that's sort of a common business challenge. And so what we're trying to do is get that data from the customer's environment and then not only bubble up the issues, but bubble up the issues in sort of the prioritized list in which you need to tackle them. So not just, hey, you've got these uh, systems, these containers or these virtual machines or instances that have a log4j issue, but like this one over here, this one's super important because it's holding your critical data, 
it's got a better, a bigger exposure to the internet. And so the idea is with more data and visibility into your platform, we can help give you better insights and drive smarter actions on your behalf, because you know, as a, as a security team, as a DevOps focused team, that you've got more than enough work on your plate. Um, trying to solve every little uh, problem with your new environment just isn't realistic. So you need help trying to prioritize and contextualize that. And that's really what we're trying to do. What a, I want to dive into that a little bit, but before I do, I have to yeah. say your background is incredible. Um, consummate <laughs> professional, and I'm not just saying that because you're a fellow Canadian, uh, but I do love that background, by the way. Um, Thank you. I appreciate exciting. it. So I want to dive into Polygraph a little bit. Um, one, I love the name because it yep. implies a human element, and I think you're you're combining human intuition with, with data sets um, uh, and, and doing it with ease. But I also want to talk, before we go down any of those paths, I want to talk about the the piece of context aware because not mm -hmm. only are you pulling in context via agent and agentless mechanisms, um, not only are you pulling in a, a whole bunch of dimensionality from from the cloud, from containers, etc., um, but you're also as you're as you're collecting all that information, you're also enriching. You have the you know with reversing labs, putting in GOIP, threat vectors, some other things. So you're bringing in a ton of data together. Um, how easy is it to start collecting that? Now I mentioned agent and agentless, but how easy is it and how long does it take for the average consumer to be up and running, getting some data and, and getting to some of those dossiers that you produce as a result? How quick is that process? How, how, how easy is it? Yeah, for our customers, it's super easy. For us in the back end, it's it's a continuing challenge because of the mountain of data that we're dealing with. Um, but we've really focused on that uh, customer experience to get it up and running. Um, and you mentioned, you know, two different approaches of that data collection with the agentless and the agent based. And obviously, with an agent, there's uh, challenges with the teams and deploying software out to those systems. So where most customers start is they'll get the agent up and uh, the agentless up and running because that's simply connecting to the cloud service provider. So whether that's AWS. Azure or Google Cloud, um, or even connecting into a Kubernetes environment to get the, uh, the control plane logs from there. Um, that happens really, really quickly. You can have those connections automated through our API or the CLI within a, within minutes and data starts coming in. Um, and then the, the uh, we start drawing insights almost immediately. And of course, the longer that we're looking at that data, the bigger and more complete a picture that we can uh, uh, build. Um, so you'll start to see uh, significant visibility within the first day because we've gotten enough information to build out that picture. And then as those agents come online um, and we also have inline scanners for infrastructure as code and other uh, container image scanning and things like that. And all those data sources all contribute into this, uh, into a more, um, um, a robust and uh, enriched picture because you mentioned some of those third party sources. We also have our own Lacework Labs team who do original research and pour that into our modeling. Um, and we're always getting external data. And the way I sort of explain it, um, even to new uh, Lacework employees as they come on board, is you know we're trying to build up uh, a picture um, of a customer's environment through uh, what they're doing, what we know about their cloud service provider, and what we know about the threat landscape in general. And then we try to build a picture of that environment. And then we're constantly getting new pictures and sort of comparing them um, very much, uh, you know, like the old Sesame Street thing of one of these things is not like the other to try to surface out what's different. And obviously the more data and the longer we look, the better. Um, but we've really streamlined that initial experience to get customers connected within minutes and then drawing insights shortly thereafter um, and seeing a huge amount of value in day one. That's so Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> um, so, so Mark, it, with that um, background on, on a polygraph, so when you talk about um, that whole concept of de a threat detection and taking all those elements, so there's, uh, there's data points coming from the environment, you're using a set of rules uh, that are built off of maybe compliance, net, uh, compliance frameworks as well. Mm -hmm. um, what's the ability to tailor some of those rules because some organizations from a detective measure don't subscribe to any one particular framework. They want to uh, enrich it further. So how does Polygraph actually enable the additional enrichment for a particular uh, client's environment? 
Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. And it's an interesting uh, answer is because we try to do two things that are almost the complete opposite, is that we try to make it as low touch as possible to generate insights. Um, so no rules, we'll do anomaly-based detection to highlight things that are, um, that are potential risks for that particular customer's environment. So even just behaviors. So the example I normally give for folks is if uh, when I'm looking at poly, my polygraph uh, data platform account and it's pointed at all my research accounts, all those accounts normally have short-lived jobs that are spitting up weird services all the time. Nothing lasts longer than, than a few minutes because of the nature of the research that I'm, I'm doing. And so if I start to run something 24-7, um, after a couple hours, the platform will flag and say, this is super weird. Like, this is not your normal behavior. Um, you should probably look into this. And the opposite is true for most of our enterprise customers where, you know, they're running stuff that's pretty steady state. And so when they see lots of little things pop up uh, uh, in and out, then that that's a, an anomalous behavior. And that just happens automatically. We try to make that those insights just driven and they just show up uh, ready for action by the customer without them having to do any rules, without them having to do any particular insights. So that's sort of the, the easy uh, button approach where it just, these valuable insights just show up in Slack or in your uh, in, as a Jira ticket or in your inbox, whatever you want. Um, but then the opposite, we also uh, provide that tool set for those security professionals, maybe for forensic investigators like myself who know what they're trying to look for. We have what we call the Lacework Query Language or LQL that lets them write all this custom uh, query language to find and alert on specific things that they're out to detect. So we're trying to hit both ends of that spectrum of making it easy and just, you know, magically showing insights, if I may use that term, though we all know it's not magic, it's a lot of math, um, to show you those insights of what is concerned to you in your specific environment, but then also give you that query language tooling to dive as deep as you want. And of course, we have a whole bunch of prepackaged, all the compliance frameworks are ready out of the gate. So whether you're looking at CIS or PCI or, or NIST or SOC, whatever the case may be, um, we've got comparisons again against all that stuff. So it's really, uh, you know, I find taking a practitioner's view um, and providing you the right information at the right time. So so in, in practicality, would I look at, would I look to the Lacework policy platform to, to maybe extend some of the frameworks where I use LQL to start doing kind of statistical modeling and, and extracting some, some, some data? Is that, and LQL is loosely based on SQL, I, I imagine. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the LQL language is, is very intuitive. Um, you know, it's it's very much like the SQL, like select this, wear this, yeah. you know, under these conditions um, and customized to the security data set and to the cloud data sets that you're dealing with. Um, and the idea really is, is twofold. So if we go that sort of that automatic insight route um, in the events and the alerts, we're really bubbling those up with, you know, this is what happened. This is who made it happen. This is when it happened. This is where it happened. And this is why we think it happened um, to make that as actionable as possible possible right out of the gate. And then that flip side is if you're saying, well, you know, we have this custom application and we want to make sure that it never does X or when it does, we want to be alerted. Then you can write a very specific and targeted query, um, or you could do threat hunting activities there. Um, and if that isn't enough for you, and we do have cases where we've got companies with really mature threat hunting teams, um, and they want to do even a deeper dive, then you can actually export the data into your Snowflake account or into uh, Amazon S3 buckets to look at the raw data yourself if the query language isn't quite enough for you. So we're really trying to enable all those scenarios, but with a focus on making it as easy as possible to take action on the alerts uh, and insights that are generated from the platform. Because I know from my experience, and I know from talking to uh, customers and communities around the world, is there's nothing more frustrating than getting an alert from your security control that you're not quite sure what to do with. Um, and for me, that's a nightmare scenario. And that's something we actively try to avoid with our platforms to make sure that everything is, is clear, is insightful, and is ready for you to take action against. Yeah, yeah there, there's something in that too. Um, so uh, I don't know if you can elaborate on anything here, but if, if we look at ML, there's the curse of dimensionality. And, and you, mm -hmm. look, you have a lot of abstractions. You can look at the host level, the user level, the network level, the region, the, the accounts, the... You have a lot of dimensionality in there, and yet, um, you know, that becomes a really complex math problem uh, as we're processing that. But Lacework does it uh, exceptionally well. So I, I don't know if there's anything to really relieve uh, or dive into there, except that congratulations on on being able to process that degree of information and give insights. But I would ask the question: How are people practically um, acting on those insights? Do you do you find that most companies are just integrating this in with their SIM, Slack? you know, pager duty, whatever, 
uh, or are they really living and breathing inside of lace work? What, what, are, what are large enterprises typically doing to consume and act on those? Yeah, well, A, thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I would love to take credit, but we've got some of the best data scientists and data modeling uh, folks out there um, working for us, working hard on that. Um, you know, and I was, I literally apologize to them in the new hire onboarding because my explanation is so simplified compared to the complexities that they're dealing with. Um, but the advantage is that we don't need to know those complexities. We just know that the the insights that are generated are, are accurate and valuable and, and ready to roll. Um, and as far as how people are using them, the, you know, we've got an entire spectrum depending on the sort of maturity of a team. So for our smaller business customers um, and smaller teams who are using our platform, a lot of that work happens within the UI because the, you know we've got some great visualizations, uh, a lot of ability to drill down into sort of the visualization of the polygraph, which ends up being a, a node um, and edge uh, graph uh, that you can chart you know, what process is talking to what, um, and you can literally visually see everything. Um, so smaller teams really like that, but as we move up sort of the maturity ladder and the um, size of the team into larger enterprises, they almost never actually log into the UI for the platform. They're interacting through uh, the API and then the events being pushed out. And so what we see is a very common pattern there is they're routing those uh, alerts and those insights into the team that is best positioned to actually do something about it. So sometimes, and a lot of the times that starts with the security team, um, but then they start to use that either as a conversation with the teams that are building the actual uh, solutions or they're writing those uh, alerts directly into um, either GitHub or Jira for those teams to action. Or a lot of the time we see people running uh, sort of chat operations where they're dumping it into Slack as sort of a conversation starter saying like, hey, Mark, you just rolled out this infrastructure and there's a bunch of security challenges here. You know, what do you want to do about it? Uh, this is why we think it's a concern. Uh, this is why it was flagged. Let's work together to move that forward. And, you know, I like that as a practitioner because it's, it's a pragmatic view. Uh, a lot of the time, I think in the security community, we kind of get uh, the horse blinders on and go like, everything we see, we have to action is the most important thing. When the reality is it's one of many concerns for the team that's trying to build a solution. They've got bugs to fix. They've got new features to roll out. So uh, what we're trying to do at Lacework is make sure that those insights that are generated have enough context so that you can actually prioritize them among that stack and say like, yeah, that feature is actually more important because this security issue, even though it may be rated a, you know an eight out of 10 10 and the CVSS score for vulnerability, given what how you've deployed that asset that's vulnerable, it's actually not that important for you. You can take a little bit of time. You can get to it later in the week. And I think that's that pragmatic approach really, really pays off. Yeah. So uh, that's a good segue, Mark. Uh, thank you for that into a question around from you. The detection side is where uh, a lot of the, the value is, is present from polygraph. And the mm -hmm. output of it is entirely relevant to the code and build side. So some of the alerts or the forwarding of this information to the right teams uh, is super compelling. Now, do you see that or how maybe does lace work actually integrate into maybe the prevention side of things uh, during code development. Are there teams that are in the IDE that can plug in uh, to some aspect of, of uh, polygraph or how do you see that playing out on the build and, and dev side of things before code is actually committed? Yeah, and that's that's obviously the best place to solve a problem is to make sure it isn't actually a problem that hits production. Um, and so uh, a few months ago, we acquired a company called Soluble um, that is now uh, under our uh, banner as Lacework uh, Infrastructure Code Protection, I believe is the official name. Um, we keep uh, playing around with that. So I'd, I, honestly, I'd have to double check. Um, but what it is is infrastructure is code security. And so we're looking at cloud formation templates. We're looking at Terraform execution plans. And we're trying to highlight uh, potential issues before you actually deploy them out. And so a lot of the time with our customers who have adopted this technology, um, it almost never even hits the security team because it's geared towards the people who are building it. it it's geared towards those developers and the operational folks so that they know, hey, wait a minute, this uh, S3 bucket is open to the world and that's a bad thing in this case because it's not a public website. So we're going to fix that before it ever goes out. Or this security group is too wide. Somebody could SSH in from somewhere where we don't want them to. Um, you know, Things like of that nature, highlighting 
highlighting those issues early on are really, really critical. Um, and then that continues as they actually go down their CI/CD pipeline. We go into contain container image scanning, um, looking at the layers there and highlighting, like, hey, this, there's a potential vulnerability here. Um, you don't have any other mitigations in place. You may want to solve this uh, or be aware of it at least or accept the risk. Um, and then into that runtime uh, protection um, when they actually are deployed in production. So again, the goal, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, is stop it as early as possible so it's never actually a problem. But then, you know, understanding that's not always possible. So we've got those multiple steps along the pipeline uh, and in production to highlight those issues. And again, at every stage, trying to contextualize them um, as much as possible uh, so that people can actually change them. Because I know if you just get an alert that says, you know, just a simple error message that says this is bad, it's not really actionable. So giving them that insight that, you know, in your environment, this is not good because of the following reasons, that's way more useful for a developer, for someone in operations or in security. So, so if we look at IAC, um, how does, how does the, how does this behavior work? Is it, I, I think Sabir started going down this path mm -hmm. as I'm developing, am I getting feedback in the IDE or when I do a PR or commit, it triggers a scan and then it produces the results. Where, where, where am I interacting as a developer um, with with that this part of the product at least? Yeah, we're and that's a good good point. And thanks for calling that out. Where where we see most teams integrating it today is in sort of that deploy uh, or code commit. Uh, action. So they commit it into the repository. Um, and if there's been a change, then it'll trigger a scan and pull back. Um, we've got some fun stuff that we're working on as far as developer experience earlier, um, because as they are writing it out, it does make sense to kind of highlight um, almost like a linter or a syntax checker, like, hey, by the way, this is kind of bad. Um, but a lot of the time where uh, I find uh, the challenge there is that if you act too early, you don't necessarily have the full context. So if I go back to that example of like an NS3 bucket being public, sometimes that's actually what you want. Um, so if you're rolling out your website and you're hosting the static code in S3, you want it to be publicly readable because it's a website. Um, if you're putting P uh, PII or you know uh, health information, you absolutely don't want that to be the case. And so until you have more context, you can't make that simple decision. Um, so we want to make that as a positive experience for the developer as possible. Um, so right now that sort of happy median is in the, I check it in, it gets scanned and then I get the result back. Uh, but there's a lot of exciting possibilities moving it even earlier into the IDE. Yeah, I really like that. Um, so, so today then just staying on that product and mm -hmm. I definitely want to move into compliance and some of the vulnerability and, and threat. Um, so today you're working with some of the transpilers, so mm -hmm. uh, CloudFormation. Uh, are you doing anything in Azure and Google in that space, um, or is it is it AWS only at this point? Plus Terraform. Um, I, I don't know if it's like Pulumi or Tropos. Like if you work with any other uh, products or languages, what what does that look like? And are you starting with Terraform? I think a lot of people do. Yeah, moving to the CSPs, covering all of them because your compliance certainly is is very mature on all CSPs. Where are mm -hmm. you right now with respect to the IAC component? Yeah, for IAC out live today for everybody, uh, Terraform and CloudFormation, um, I'm 100% sure on that one. Okay. Uh, and then there's a long list of prioritized uh, other environments. So we are looking at um, things like the AWS CDK, Pulumi, um, you know, in Azure, the native, uh, the resource manager in uh, Google Cloud as well. Um, so all those are coming soon. But of course, the you know the biggest uh, biggest commitment or the biggest use right now from uh, most people is Terraform, um, and so that's top of mind for us because the challenge we also have is all of those uh, DSLs are also changing uh, quite often as well. And we wanna make sure that we can provide a consistent experience uh, across them. So I would say that the, the strong answer, um, the one that nobody uh, you know, in the company is gonna yell at me for is Terraform and cloud formation, and we're actively looking at everything else. It's absolutely fair. All right, so then we move to compliance. So this is where we start collecting our, our context. Mm -hmm. You have every CSP, you're pulling in from every audit log um, uh, possible across those CSPs. And then you're uh, uh, garnering additional context from, um, from various workloads. And this is where some of the agents in, in um, it's both an agent and agent list combination. Uh, everything's container aware. So how do you now connect those two? So I've, uh, if you look at the static website example, which is a great one, how do I connect the two? So when I do my commit, I've got assets now, I've connected my cloud, 
you're scanning the cloud, you maybe I've got some agents on various uh, assets in one of those CSPs. How do we connect that that context and, and start doing something interesting um, and, and reducing some of the false positives potentially based on context? Yeah, and so false positives and false negatives are always a challenge, especially when machine learning is involved, um, because you know there are uh, judgments being made essentially by the algorithm and varying levels of confidence. And so, you know, our our worst case scenario is that false negative, uh, when you know something's on fire and nothing is said. Um, not that we want false positives where nothing's on fire but somebody said it was. Um, but you know, reality is, and you know, this may seem surprised to some of the audience, but I will tell you as as a security professional who happens to work for a vendor. No security control is perfect. No platform is perfect. We strive to be as good as we can, but there's always going to be challenges. Um, but where we're looking at when it comes to that sort of that context and moving in, uh, into compliance and connecting those dots is when uh, an alert is generated is allowing within the interface and within the API uh, for the customers to, to reply back and essentially say, no, this is okay with me. Um, so if the system is saying like, this is bad and here's why I think it is bad for the human being able to say, Okay, I, you know, understanding that context, I'm now going to use my judgment and say, no, I'm going to suppress that alert, and then that will adjust back into the platform. So unless something else changes about that, it's not going to bother you again. So if you had that bucket that was public, and it alerts you and says, hey, this is bad, you know, based on what we think, uh, you know, we're seeing here, this is probably something you want to address. You can turn around and say, no, I'm okay with that. Here's why, um, and then that will be suppressed for future analysis until something else significant changes. So if you uh, change that access control again, or you can connected it to something new, it would say, wait a minute, the risk variables have changed here. Maybe you want to reevaluate that. So it's it's trying to strike that balance. And again, you know, the, the overall challenge for any security control is trying to thread that needle between usability and security, right? Because the more you bug somebody, the more they're going to be like, oh, I don't want to deal with this anymore. And so you need to make sure that when you are bothering, uh, when the system is bothering someone, that it's delivering that valuable insight and at least saying like, hey, this is why I think this is important. And if you know better as a security pro, that's cool too. Um, and we'll take that into account. This is, I just want to ask a really bizarre, um, this is really bizarre. If, if, okay. I'm, if I'm making the wrong choices, so if you've presented mm -hmm. some behavior that you think I have to action and I make just what, just a bizarre choice, do I start training the heuristics to start recognizing that preference and then does that change anything or, or do you effectively override and say, look, I, I get that you have context that I can't appreciate. You're, you're the human <laughs> operator, you're the human overlord. But uh, at some point I, I need to continue to flag this. Could I potentially take this down an incorrect path based on my behavior and the based on, on machine learning? I, I understand why you phrase that as a bizarre question. I think that's a really insightful question. Um, and it's interesting because I normally get that in a different context. And normally how this question comes up is if someone, uh, someone will ask, if I'm deploying the polygraph data platform into my environment, what if there's already an attack in progress? Will it then learn that that is actually good behavior? Um, and the answer is no, but it's not as overtly uh, obvious as if it if it wasn't happening, right? So um, for the attack scenario, what ends up happening is that most of the time the platform will still see the exfiltration as uh, because we know it's going to a bad uh, or an unknown IP or an IP that no nobody's ever uh, gone to from that environment or something with a negative reputation. So we can flag it on sort of that step or some step in the process will will flag. But as far as the human overriding and saying like, no, no, I really do want to shoot myself in the foot. Please let me. This is a good thing. I want. I don't like my feet. I'm keep going down this path. There are other overriding concerns, but most of the time what that will happen is the platform will then adjust as opposed to going a critical alert, it will push it down to a lower severity alert based on your input. And then over time that will bubble up again because other things will keep saying that's bad because the this is when the advantage, uh, the complexity of security comes to an advantage because it's almost never just one thing. It's normally a sequence of things and other things in that sequence are gonna start screaming enough that even though you've pushed one, one mole in the whack-a-mole down the others are going to pop up and you'll have to deal with them so yes you can influence it but you can't get to the point where it's just like no the house is on fire and you're good that's never going to happen there's enough safeguards built into the platform there's enough complexity and other things happening that it's going to bubble up and still tell you like the smoke detector is going to go off and you're still going to have to respond yeah that's so, absolutely fair so maybe building a little bit on that uh thread there 
Uh, so, Mark, uh, I, of course, there's the standard, let's say, algorithm, the machine model that comes out of the box that then learns off your environment to what we're just talking about. How is that continuously kind of refreshed on the back end? Because I imagine that the, the data science models uh, that are continuously being evolved um, by, by the mothership le at Lacework and all those smart data scientists, are they, um, how is that being pushed out? And then where are the learnings from potentially, I know this could be a little touchy to uh, topic, where are the learnings from other, let's say enterprises or institutions or customers also saying, hey, you know, this unique situation was, was seen and this other client we need to integrate this and push this out so that, you know everyone's model can pick this up at the, at the same time. Yeah, and and I guarantee you this answer uh, is going to get me. You know, my Slack channel is going to light up internally as I'm going to miss some of the the nuance, but I think I, I can handle it reasonably because it is a really good question. Um, and the easy answer is that it's not just one model; it's a series of models. And so there's, we try to focus as much as possible on a specific customer to give them those individualized insights. But there's a couple levels of global models that we know, like a rotten apple is a rotten apple, and it doesn't matter if you know you have it in your environment; it's still rotten. Um, so there is that layer of this is generically just bad no matter what, mm -hmm. um, and that gets applied. And so how we end up tuning and uh, you know improving our modeling um, is on a multiple different areas. And so we have um, from customer learnings, uh, from uh, from our Lacework Labs doing original research and saying, hey, we saw these new attacks, um, and they publish that research out in regular cloud threat reports that you can get on our blog, um, and that kind of stuff goes directly into our modeling, saying like, hey, we saw Cyber Criminal Collective X doing these kind of attack moves, and that's now something that we're looking for and we're looking for those abnormal behaviors. Um, the other thing is that because of the way we approach with the uh, anomaly detection, we actually don't need to know what we're looking for. What we need to know is that what you normally do, and this is just something different. So I go back to that, you know, I'm old enough that the Sesame Street reference always keeps popping up. They got me good in my, my childhood years of, you know, this thing is not like the others. I just need to know that the others look the same and this doesn't. And so it, you know, then I try to add uh, and enrich that information to try to figure out whether that difference is good or bad. So we've got all these layers working together. Um, and this, this may throw you, but bear with me for a second. The other place we really improve the modeling significantly is when we fail. So when we have an issue that we don't detect at the right level, um, which is most of the time uh, when we have a failure, it's that we detected it, but we classified it too low, not that it was missed completely. That's when we kick into, into gear with our customer success team, with our, um, with our, our labs team and our other uh, subject matter experts to really figure out what went wrong. And then all that information goes right back into all the layers of modeling so that we uh, improve every single time. Like I said before, no security control or systems perfect. Um, and we've really built a culture internally of any time we see any slippage or anything not quite as good as it should have been, how do we learn from that? And how do we drive that learning directly back into the platform so that everybody benefits from it? And then that is just a continuous activity. We're learning on from the failures. We're learning from new research. We're learning from changes at the CSPs. Anywhere we can, where we can find an advantage for our customers, we're going to take that and build that into our modeling. Awesome. All right, so one follow-up on that then. So now you've got all of this data and, and it's up to date. How are you interacting? So, so we've got private repos, we've got public and third party repos, we've got um, mm -hmm. containers that are just sitting there, they're dormant, they haven't been deployed. You've got, now you've got containers that, oh yeah, we have some runtime also slaved off those containers. When are you triggering scans? Um, what triggers those scans? Where are you scanning? How are you connecting the dots from some of these repos to runtime? How, how often is that kicking off? Is that an orchestrated process? Is that one that I have control over? Do you have control over it? What does that look like? Is that, that, that is a, also a very interesting um, uh, mechanism of keeping our vulnerabilities in check. Yeah. So anything in the clouds, uh, in your cloud service providers, uh, accounts or environment that's getting pulled automatically as changes are happening. Um, so, uh, on a consistent basis, if you're spinning up stuff in AWS, we're pulling in all the cloud trail information, um, you know, in Google cloud and Azure, we're doing that constantly once the connections are made. Um, so that's happening automatically. And then anything from our agents, um, that is also coming in, um, you know, from runtime as it's happening, once that configuration 
operation is set up. So there's a huge chunk of this data collection that's just purely automatic. And then on the other side of it, sort of earlier before things end up into production, um, this is where you've got a lot of uh, more ability to fine tune. So with the scanners, um, with the with the IAC scanner, with the container image scanning, um, things like that is where you have control of when you want to trigger it and whether you want to build that as part of your pipeline, whether it's on code check-in, whether it's on, on demand, um, you can fire it off through the API or the CLIs. Um, and so that flexibility of sort of um, matches up with what the customer expectation is essentially. If it's running in the cloud, I, I just don't want to think about it. I just want to see results. If I'm developing, depending on your style of development, when you want to trigger that stuff is going to be different. So if you're doing, you know, sort of we build once a day, having it automatic totally makes sense. Um, if you're checking in code several times an hour, Maybe you don't want to scan on every check-in. Maybe you want to automatically trigger that, or maybe you want to have it based on only when it goes to a certain branch that you then want to trigger that. So all of that is up to you to line up. Um, we try to make it as flexible as possible. Um, sort of an unofficial model uh, or motto internally for that is we don't want to change the way you work. We just want to fit into how you're ex uh, uh, how you are working today and make that as smooth as possible for you. Actually, so on that too, and I think you I think you may have answered it, but. Um... Uh, I just want to go back to it. When Sabir was asking earlier, we've been spending a lot of time on the detective, but there's also a preventative element that, like, I don't know if you can prevent. If I find a vulnerability in in a repo for, for a container image, can I prevent you from converting that to something in runtime? Um, if I find certain parameters that that I think as, at a company level are, are pretty important in, in your Terraform modules, can I prevent you from deploying that code or is it really look we just want to give you as much data as possible you humans have to determine what to do with this and when to do something with it how how i, I know you can probably walk the line but is can i go to a more kind of draconian control in terms of preventative mechanisms yeah for sure um so those two examples uh are are perfect uh, ones where people do quite often. Um, so we have a Kubernetes admission controller um, for the container image scanning. So if it fails uh, your risk threshold, then you can just have the admission controller say, nope, that's never going to hit production. Um, and you know that is quite a common thing because a lot of the time you can adjust that sort of sensitivity and say, look, it needs to pass this, it needs to hit this level of bad before I put my foot down. Um, and that, that's a common practice. Um, you know, And a lot of the time where people apply that is if it's not a blessed container, if it has you know, if it's not pulled from this specific repo, and if it hasn't passed this scanning for security, then it's never getting into, into production. And that's a good practice to follow. Um, for uh, the Terraform, for infrastructure as code scanning, where you're going to want to do that isn't actually within our product. It ends up being within the build pipeline. So you'll use the output from our scanner as a yes, no um, for the next step in your build pipeline, just like you would for any sort of unit testing or integration testing. And that's sort of the best way I think to think of in, uh, infrastructure as code security is it's just another type of quality control testing um, and you treat it the same as you would. So if you had an integration test fail or a performance test fail, you probably don't want to keep deploying out to production. Same thing with if you have a security test fail, you can have your build pipeline just stop and fail the build based on the results of that report. Um, and if you want to take that a step further um, for all the stuff we do in production, um, we don't have remediation today in the platform uh, because it turns out that's a really difficult decision to make. It's not a hard thing to implement. It's a hard thing to decide when to implement. So where we end up helping is uh, hooking up automations that are native to the cloud service provider. So in AWS, it's uh, you know triggering off a Lambda. When a certain event is emitted, then having a Lambda do the response for you. Um, our professional services team, our field teams are really good at helping customers with that because that really needs to be customized to your environment. Again, you, know, you mentioned you use the word draconian. Nobody likes when stuff just dies out of production for no reason. And then you find out, oh, it was the security team dropped it for something that you don't understand why. Um, so finding out that sort of uh, what the risk tolerance is and where a lot of customers fall on that spectrum is if something in production is bad, having it pop up in Slack or Teams or whatever your chat app is, is sort of the best thing of saying like, hey, Darren, this is not so hot anymore. Here's why we think this is bad. We want to take this action, yes or no. Um, and so if finding that uh, that is very possible. And again, it sort of ties to the overall theme of automation is a way forward with cloud security. And if you're not automating it, you're probably not going to be successful in the long term. So is it fair to say when you go to market and you're, you're working with an enterprise, because one of the things we recognize is a lot of our customers have gone, 
um, uh, into product mode, where now product teams they have their own PNL, they're responsible mm -hmm. for their product, um, and and wherever that execution domain is, whether it's cloud, whether it's on prem, wherever it is, they're responsible, and and then they have team topologies that support their efforts and 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 it's domain driven design. Are you finding that? Uh, in terms of, of, of purchase of, of a footprint or a starting point, is it now with the product teams that are getting more interested in, hey, this can certainly help us go faster and more efficiently and keep us off the radar? Or are you still going to the security team and saying, hey, you probably want to partner with your developers. This is a great way to do it. And they use it as an enabling function. Um, sometimes that can cause a little bit of friction if security is pushing down yet another um, um, set of mandates or, or, or technologies. So where are you finding this kind of success in terms of go to market uh, in, in today's day and age? Yeah, we're, and we're seeing both, um, but where a lot of it is coming from is sort of that centralized from the security team, from the compliance concerns. Um, and then what they're using the platform's output for is to start conversations with those teams. So you mentioned keeping off the radar, and that's a very common thing for those business unit teams to be like, okay, if we just if we just stay quiet enough and <laughs> deliver good bottom line, nobody's going to yell. And by the time something bad happens, we'll have enough reputation internally to kind of weather the storm. And we're not not going to get shut down. Um, and that speaks to a long history of how security culture and security teams operate. Um, you know, we can have a whole different discussion about that someday. Um, but where we're really trying to do is say, you know, hey, you're all in the same boat. You're all trying to do the same thing, which is deliver solutions to your customers um, that are resilient, that are reliable. Well, guess what? That's security. Right, that's not just performance and building uh, code well. Um, that's also big security concerns. Right, the, the thing I always talk about when I'm uh, engaging with customers and giving talks is that security is really about making sure that your systems do what they're intended to do, and only what they're intended to do. And it's that only that they're intended to do where people stumble because a lot of times developers see security as sort of the enemy. So going to market for us, um, you know, we're talking to both and we're, we're doing a lot of business with both sides, but where we're seeing a ton of success, especially in the larger enterprises is enabling the security teams, not only to wrap their heads around what they're dealing with, but to start those conversations and to start building the bridges with those teams to show them that they're there to help enable them and to help make sure that they're successful and to actually take load off of those business unit teams so they don't have to worry as much about some of the uh, more um, nuanced and complex security issues. And if as long as they're making smart building decisions, that they've got a partner in security. So we're trying to hit both, but you know, the reality is it's uh, there's, there's cultural challenges within the teams to deal with too. Yeah. Well, Mark, uh, it was great to have you on our show today. We implore our audience to really reach out uh, to Lacework ourselves at Incubator for any questions that you uh, you may have or follow ups. Uh, again, cloud security is top of mind for everyone, or it ought to be. And uh, Lacework has a good, compelling uh, story here. So please do reach out, Mark. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks.